Thank you. Thank you very much, Vitali, and thank you very much, Sergei. I appreciate very much the opportunity, the invitation, and the opportunity to, uh, to be with you today. This is a very, very important conference, and I, I see quite a few people from various countries, which is exactly how it should be, including my original home country, Greece. I remember very dearly, Vitaly, how you had invited and uh, you had to ask me from Kazakhstan to come. These were different times. And of course, as you remember, we met in some other meetings after that. I would like to start by saying that I have prepared a very special talk for you today, recognizing that this is a meeting, European Polymer Conference and at the same time, a medical conference. So I wanted to make sure that I would cover both areas. But in the process, it was very important for me to recognize my host uh, and his laboratory. Vitaly Gudriansky has done really some wonderful work in uh, adhesion and bioadhesion and mucoadhesion. You saw the previous talk that was just presented before mine. And so I wanted today to make a few comments because as Vitaly and I know, in the last 20 years, there have been many other investigators who have come in the field, but have not looked at the, point, at the problem as carefully as they should be. So in my talk today, I'm going to talk a little bit about advanced theories and a little bit about biological experiments and make some comments. I'm delighted the talk is being recorded and it will be available to all of you and I assume selected others so that people can see really how I feel about this subject. And I just pushed and nothing is happening. Why nothing is happening? Ah, okay, thank you. I don't know if this is my first slide or my, yeah, it is. Okay, so first from the biological aspects. What is mucoadhesion and bioadhesion? It's an important field of the medical studies. And we use it a lot when we have to interact biopolymers with cells. For example, don't forget the people uh, that started from the work of uh, Dennis Discher at UPenn and then many, many others. And now if you open the literature, you will see that people are studying how cells interact with polymers and how the polymer gel and its mechanical characteristics makes a big difference in uh, cell proliferation. What people, however, don't say very much is what the bioadhesion part is in it. The other people are the people who work on drug delivery. They're talking about using mucoadhesion, bioadhesion, cell adhesion for what purpose? to slowly absorb certain drugs, therapeutic agents to specific sites. And of course, if you look at those immobilization studies, they could be in the intestine, in the stomach, in the nose, in the buccal area, in the sublingual area. So there are many, many aspects. But the problem is not only a biological problem. It's a macromolecular project problem. It's basically the adhesion of two macromolecular systems that are compatible or partially compatible and come together. And when you start looking at that part, the first thing you're going to say as a polymer scientist, oh, it's an interaction of functional groups. And there is no doubt, as you will see in my subsequent slides, that hydroxyl groups, carboxyl groups, certain amino containing groups help that interaction. But it's not only that. And that is going to be my major message today. As people develop new biomedical and biological applications, they are forgetting that these polymers that they use, they have tethers, they have end chains, they interact with the surrounding environment. And so it becomes very important to look at molecular theories for this macromolecular, macromolecular interaction, and then use the results to really uh, help us come up with new systems. This is very important for me and I, all my life, as some of you know, I have been in the field 51 years. 
Uh, I came to the United States in 1971 and I became a, pro a, a graduate student at MIT with Professor Merrill and then a postdoc. And it was there that I met Bob Langer. Bob and I are exactly the same age and we have been friends for life. I have been an independent researcher since 76. I like it as long as God allows me and I don't have any major diseases. I will continue practicing my, my group. And I love theories. I understand that it is important to have translational work and you will see it today, but I want to be able to understand the theoretical models. So I go back to the literature, actually that happened some time ago, and especially being here with Dr. Filippo and Filippo Fekutoriansky, they know very well the first name. And one of the earliest names that I see when I work in polymer, polymer dehesion is the, the work of Wojcicki. Wojcicki, I would say 1959, although probably he was active before that. And it's important, and I tell those of you who are graduate students or young investigators, please read the literature and read the literature carefully and recognize the old timers. And if the editor of your journal says, oh, we don't publish any paper that has any reference before 1990 or 2000, tell her, well, I'm sorry, this is a paper that people need to know. So Wojcicki wrote a wonderful book, which is available in English. I assume it was in Russian as well, uh, called Autoadhesion. Actually, he would call it also Autoadhesion. And basically, it's a process of two polymers coming together. And look what he says, depending on their ability to diffuse through each other. And notice where the paper was published. That has always surprised me. Rubber Chemistry and Technology. Really a journal that you wouldn't really expect a Soviet scientist to publish in. Well, it turns out that Wojcicki did come to the United States. So probably there was an association with but the next thing I want to show you is the idea of interdigitation. Those of you who still love the work of Pierre Gilles de Zen, our Nobel laureate of 1991, you must have seen his work with Brochard. And in that work, there is a very nice theoretical picture of polymer interdigitation. And it says, covers most of the cases of adhesion. So already Dejan and Brochard tells you, look, if you want to have adhesion of two compounds, please look at the possibility of interdigitation. Now, it's very important for all of us to understand that that was not really appreciated very much in the early days. It was something that was forgotten. It was published in the Journal of Physical Chemistry. At the same time, there happened something, something else. Prager and Turrell. As early as 1981, I started working on a similar problem. Having two amorphous polymer phases, bring them together above the glass transition temperature and seeing how they were coming together. It's very interesting for those of you who want to hear a little bit about history. Matt Turrell is the very famous Matt Turrell, you know, who is now the director of the, of the uh, molecular Engineering Institute and Department at the University of Chicago. He has been there for 10 years. He's the same one he was at, at Minnesota and at Santa Barbara and Berkeley. When he wrote this paper, he was a graduate student. And I remember it because I was a young assistant professor when I first saw some of the work in 1978 in American Physical Society meeting. And what he was saying, you bring the two polymers together. Guess what? Under certain conditions, if you have compatibility, the junction surface, that's how he called it, the junction surface, that is the surface where the two come together, will gradually heal and disappear. Magnificent idea. When Tony Nikos and I started working on this problem, we had no idea we had no idea how Matt Torell's work and Pierre Gilles de Jean's work would help us. In the analysis of what? A biopolymer with another biopolymer or a biopolymer with a substrate under it. 
And that led to a totally new theory. I'm not going to talk about the old days, but some of the early papers uh, of Tony Mikos and me, and then Dennis Huang and a few others that you will see, uh, excuse me, Yan Bin Huang, and a few others that you will see, they were published in general chemical physics and so on. But at the same time, we were opening the door to drug delivery by publishing the journal of control release in the International Journal of Pharmaceutics. How did this come about? In 1982, I took my first sabbatical leave and I went to the University of Geneva. That's why you're going to see a few French things coming up. The University of Geneva. And I worked in a laboratory of pharmacy with professors Patrick Couvreur, Eric Delquer, and Robert Gurney. Robert was my postdoc back at Purdue in the 70s. And today we had done some work on bioadhesion. So when I arrived, Pierre Bury said, Nick, you need to address the problem of mucoadhesion, of uh, formulations and so on on surface on surfaces. I knew very little at that time, but we started talking with the company Sandoz at that time in Basel, and we came with the idea that probably this mucoadhesion would help in creating conditions where a particular drug could be released locally in the gut, in the intestine, in the nose, in the buccal area a little bit longer. So you see how the two areas come together. And it is a serendipity or a divine intervention that somebody who was a poly is a polymer scientist, but he is also a biomedical engineer, brings the two things together to solve the problem. This is the idea of interdigitation. This is from one of the early papers of, I think this is of Rochard. Look at the very left. It shows you clearly you bring two surfaces together and look what happens under certain conditions. One chain will start going from one side to the other and will bring the two surfaces together. But notice this is not a chemical reaction. This is important for me that we all notice. If it were a chemical reaction, we would be making the equivalent of a denture, something that you stick there and it stays permanently and doesn't come off. In many of the applications that uh, the previous investigator and I and many others, and of course Vitali, are, are studying, we want a system that will stay there for a period of time and then will detach. So a permanent covalent interaction is not appropriate. But the problem appears, and it is already described by Dejean very nicely in this figure three, and the problem is, okay, I have a long chain. Does this mean that the chain is naturally going to go from one side to the other? And he started looking at the possibility, no, it's going to turn around and it's going to start hitting again the surface. So you are going to have certain parts of the chain of the so-called bioadhesive chain that will never be uh, contributing to the adhesion. Some of these ideas were also uh, looked upon in Prager Torel. I know that Turel went and did a sabbatical at the Collège de France in Paris, a little bit later than me, I think around 86. I don't know if one uh, influenced the other. I knew, of course, De Gen very well, and I can say that he influenced me very much, and I still love his ideas. Anybody who is a pseudo-physicist likes De Gen because likes this idea of this abstract chains doing things in space. So let's come now to the application of the bioadhesive. It's rather simple. Come up with something that I would call a bioadhesive polymer that will be in contact with the tissue, and that can be the mucus, of course. It can be the cells. It can be something else, and will stay there for a period of time. In many cases, you have a mucus. So you have a mucosa. Some other cases, the mucus doesn't exist. For example, if you are trying to deliver in the eye, as my good friend Laura and Sine Hughes, and also, of course, Justin Haynes have been trying to do, there, there is not really much mucus, but there are interfacial characteristics. This is the problem. This is the application. Where can be applied? You know the answers in a variety of systems. So you come in and you say, now, 
the problem of bioadhesion, of mucoadhesion, of cell adhesion, is not simply a problem of finding something that sticks there. It's much more than that. Uh, and of course, the tethers that may be coming out of the polymer become very important. Just to remind you something, I apologize if I'm too basic, but I wanted to be speaking at the same level. I want to remind you that the mucus especially, uh, mucus is produced mostly by the goblet cells. And what I keep telling everybody when I give talks of similar nature is, Yes, goblet cells will produce mucus every six hours, but it's not like it is a process of a Dirac function going up and down. There's going to be always a continuous production of mucus, which means don't worry if some of the mucus becomes old, quote unquote, and sloughs off. There is new mucus that is produced. So there's going to be a dynamic equilibrium, if I can use this word. However, the surface is uneven. So what I'm saying there in the second like uneven coating, it's not like a straight flat surface. This is very important to understand. And then you go to the other characteristics. And the most important thing is, yes, look at the last thing. Yes, the attachment now of a polymer adhesive, the surface to the mucus may decrease the renewal time. So I have data which shows that instead of six hours, it goes to seven. It is not something to be discussed as much in relation to drug delivery. And you will see the reasons in a few minutes when I do some other calculation. Here is your mucus. There are so many diagrams in the literature. I like this that came out of the company. Oh my God, I forgot the name now. Uh, one of the companies in England. Um, because it shows some of the characteristics. Look very close to the mucus. You have an epithelial cell layer and the mucus layer, and it seems to be extended. But if you start looking at it carefully, it seems to be turning back in. And that is very important for us. And then there are portions of it that have come off. And some of you are asking why? Because if, for example, you are in the nasal cavity, you're breathing, you're blowing your nose and so on, mucus will not stay there permanently. But be careful on the other side. You cannot bring a formulation in the form of nanoparticles or films or I don't know what else that can be placed on the mucus and obstruct the motion of what is inside the mucus. Because in the nasal cavity, as you probably know, there are cilia. C-I-L-I-A-E, cilia, and the cilia are the reason why we don't sneeze all the time. So if you come in and put a drug delivery system on top of the cilia, you are obstructing, you're changing the characteristics of the system, and you start sneezing continuously. So these are some of the important things. Now, if I look on the left side, the thing that I want you to understand is the glycoproteins. They are the most important part. Now you're going to tell me how much are they? Point and a half, one percent. This is not good enough for you to do anything. Well, surprise, surprise. Although it's only one percent, sometimes two percent, these glycoproteins are good enough to produce a viscous system. Not viscous, viscoelastic. Mucus is not viscous, it's viscoelastic. And we have done over the years many studies to show that. I want to say something with the exception perhaps of Vitali and uh, maybe Kinan Park at Purdue, my old school. I don't think as anybody else who appreciates these aspects. People have forgotten them. People give you an average value and proceed. Oh, we know what mucus is. It's not simple. It's very complex. This is the structure of the mucus, and you know most of the things about it. There is a protein core with carbohydrate side chains, which are covalently attached. And don't forget, those carbohydrates have certain structures on which you can come and interact with some polymer, some so-called bioadhesive, okay? And the whole structure is held by disulfides. There's no doubt. 
So many people will often say, when I use a mucoadhesive, do I denature the glycoproteinic network structure? Because, of course, you add the slab, the disulfides. There is no answer to that. Uh, Marriott has done a lot of work in England, and I think he's still active. And Ian Callaway used to do a lot of work in the subject. Also, he was in Wales. Uh, some of these people have uh, retired now. And, of course, the major giant on the field from the pharmaceutical aspects, you know who he is, Joe Robinson. Joe Robinson was at Wisconsin. And in fact, he was the first one who was able to put in the market a bioadhesive system through something called the Columbia Laboratories. In fact, some of his original pilots are still a wonderful man. He has passed away 12 or 13 years. And frankly, I still miss him because he was such a force of understanding molecular theories and pharmaceutical theories. Come to the last line. This is the most important line. So if you start looking at the mucus, it has a molecular weight of 2 million with subunits of 100,000. So what is between subunits? Crosslinks, chemical crosslinks. There could be. Some of them are simply ionic crosslinks. Some of them are simply entanglements. So ladies and gentlemen, my first major comment in my talk today is those who go in and tell you that nanoparticles are going to penetrate without any uh, impedance, without any barriers, penetrating the mucus, I don't think they have studied the molecular theory as well. The presence of the three-dimensional network slows down the system, the, the process. Now, some of you will say, but I read literature and I've seen papers and there is even a company that makes the systems where they pass very fast through the mucus. And especially that's very, I don't know why, but it's very, very important in Europe. The answer is very simple. Yes, in cases of diseased state, that is where you have somebody who suffers from uh, diarrhea or something like that, okay? or a case of Crohn's disease and so on. Of course, there the mucus is destroyed and the viscoelastic behavior changes and it becomes only viscous and extremely dilute. But in most cases, please, let's be careful. Let's not say that anything will pass through the mucus without any uh, impedance. So you come here, this is a system that I might want to develop. And in fact, we have developed. You have a drug carrier. Notice I don't make them spherical. In fact, I recall very briefly that the first time we were talking to Aventis in Frankfurt, uh, Aventis Gallenbecha, uh, okay? And uh, we said uh, spherical particles, and somebody said, Nicholas, they don't have to be spherical as long as they interact. But now you have the epithelial cells, you are in the upper small intestine, you have the mucus, and of course you have the glycocalyx. What do you do? What particles do you have? Big particles. If you have big particles, they will sit on top of the mucus, they will probably stop some of the motion, and they will start releasing something, which something will have to pass through them and come to the interface and go either by between the cells, as our previous speaker said, paracellular or transcellular by endocytosis and so on. And some people say, oh, no, no, no. What you can do is you can make them nanoparticles and you can put them here. And that's another possibility. You could, but then you're slowing down other processes. Now, the drug carrier, by now you have understood, it's not something inert. It has petether groups. It has, it has functional groups first. So the carboxyls or the hydroxyls will interact, but it has tethered groups. And don't tether groups, those tethers, those chains that may be a few nanometers long, have a tendency to go and get inside the mucus. Careful. As long as they are thermodynamically compatible. So if I make a drug carrier that's predominantly a methyl methacrylate, highly hydrophobic, which I want to be hydrophobic in order to release a chemotherapeutic agent, 
that is not going to be bioassay. It will simply pass on top of the mucus and continue simply because there is no drug interaction. The chains, as you will see in a few minutes, do not extend and do not form those bonds unless they are of similar compatibility. And of course, this is from something old that I wanted to add here. You're all familiar now that there are certain compounds, polyacrylic acid, everybody likes polyacrylic acid, which is a compound over here. Uh, they like it because it has the carboxyl groups. Remember that material, we will come back to it. Of course, HPC, carboxyl methyl cellulose, where the ionic compound of the carboxyl methyl helps. Now, as I talk to you about molecular theories, and I will talk more, I want to give recognition also to the pioneers. Before me, there was somebody that I had not met yet. I met him later, Professor Chuneji Nagai, who in 1971 in Japan had the idea to form something that would interact with the mucus. You see, there is a disease that appears from, they tell me, I don't know, they appears predominantly in, in Japan, Korea, China, called afe. And the disease is basically lesions on the inside of your mouth, in the buccal area, which have to be treated. So this investigator by the name of Nagai, N-A-G-A-I, I will come to him, was the first one who showed us how we could treat such systems with a mucoadhesive product, with one difference. He didn't know it was mucoadhesive, but it was working very well. And I will show you today that it was mucoadhesive. So let me come back to the mechanisms. So there is a mechanism of having these two things together that is primary bonds. We don't need it. Maybe the people in the dental field need it, but not us. We don't want to stick something there forever. Secondary chemical bonds, we like that. So how is that done? That's done by having hydroxides or carboxyls, sometimes uh, sulfates and so on. And then physical and mechanical bonds. Those of you who work closely with industry, you will figure out that industry, when they talk about mucoadhesion or bioadhesion, they don't ask you all these molecular theories. They ask you, did it stay there for half an hour because of adhesion? And it may have stayed there because of physical and mechanical bonds. How? This is a wonderful little diagram that I wrote about 30 years ago with Pierre Burey, and it comes directly out of the uh, biomedical materials theory. I want to tell you, the first one who did something like that was Professor Ed Merrill. In the paper in the 60s, he was interested in how, uh, how uh, hemoglobin and so on was interacting on surfaces and making them uh, uh, blood clotting surfaces. So what he defined is there is a rugosity. That's how this characteristic is called. There is a rugosity, an unevenness of the tissue. And now the particles come in here, or sometimes the paste. That's an adhesion, but it's not chemical. It's not chemical, but for the user, the fact that this material will stay there for half an hour or two hours is a characteristic of adhesion. And if you go back to some of the older literature, you will find out that from a point of view of pastes and liquids, I was able to come up with an analysis based on surface characteristics. And here you have the surface tensions in the direction and the interfacial tension. And this is the characteristic work of adhesion. This is what will keep the stick system together. So you try to separate them. This is what you have to overcome. Parenthesis, I'm not here today to complain, but by parenthesis is, you cannot imagine how many papers and review papers I have seen that use exactly the same figures without any reference to our work. But I guess when you do good work, you are copied. So I don't mind it anymore. But at the same time, I'm surprised that editors don't care anymore. They don't read anything. In fact, they do care. They want to make sure the papers cited are over the last five years. <laughs> um, 
And we come now to this idea, and this is from a more recent paper. This is directly Brochard and uh, De Gen, Prager and Terrell, but applied to now a real system in the biomedical field. Do exchange the penetration. Here is your one surface, this is the other surface, bring them together. If you have compatibility, they will form that. And in fact, that area will disappear. I had one nice slide, but I didn't want to give you all the slides. One nice slide that shows the disappearance of that interface. And the system becomes one system, as long as the compatibility is constant. And I come in with my students. Now, these are post-MECO students. As you know, MECO has become a major figure in tissue engineering. He is the editor of tissue engineering. He's a member of the European Academy, the Greek Academy, and, and several American academies. He's, he's one of my best students, along with Christian Seth, and a few others. <laughs> you, you will hear in a minute as well. But we come in the, in the 2000s and we say, what if I have a network next to the mucosa, and now I have these dangling ends, these tethers? Then I would be able to create a temporary adhesion. And that becomes the idea of adhesion promoters. But the question is when you have, by the way, this was the first diagram that uh, Prager and Terrell had described. Okay, so we're not far away from 63 is the reference to Prager and Terrell. So I go with some students and especially with Igor Schleifer, who is now has moved to Northwestern University, chemistry and chemical engineering and Yang Bing Huang, who is a grand professor at Tsinghua University. And we say, let's take two gels and see under what conditions they will interact. And I will show you just two or three slides. You see a chain here, coming here, penetrating, getting into the other side. And on purpose, I show it coming back out because basically we don't know what it's going to do, not yet. We all have a tendency that it is extended, but that's not correct. Especially small chains may simply come to the surface and turn around and they create what we call a mushroom. And the mushrooms do not contribute to adhesion in any way. And so we start going back to the Voyutsky theories and we go back to our mucoadhesion promoters and we start coming up with our own theories for channel entanglement and brittle fraction. Brittle fracture. What is brittle fracture? The fact that if you have now a good bond there, even in the stomach, even in the intestine, somehow it has to break. Under what conditions will break? And this is actually, yeah, it was shown for the first time in Eagle Slifer's work, but it is from the PhD thesis of Laura Serra, who is now one of the big directors of Abbott, Abvi, Abvi. And in which we show that if I have a polyacrylic acid network next to mucus and it has tethers of peg, guess what? Those tethers of peg start penetrating through it. Magnificent idea. It changed entirely the way we were designing systems. Now, people who first saw this work, they said, but peg and adhesive? No, peg is not an adhesive. It's an adhesive promoter adhesion promoter. It promotes adhesion. And of course, for it to penetrate, there have to be the right thermodynamic characteristics. And so we started working with uh, Laura, the, the paper is coming up, with Laura, different size pegs, smaller and bigger on surface polyacrylic acid. And then the question is, how many chains? How many chains do I put? I put a few, many, because I told you, if you put too many, they start extending. If you put too few, they become like a mushroom. And so we started using something that is called the uh, single chain mim field theory. And there are several papers in there. This is probably the most mathematical from the Journal of Chemical Physics. And we come up with final results. Tether chains. Yes, they work. Why? Because they change the configuration of entropy. Is the entropy increasing? No, it decreases. What about the contribution to the free energy? It's increased. What about the solvent that is around the, the tether chains? 
Well, the entropy will increase because of the solvent. You can imagine that. What about a solvent that was in the hydrogel in the material and now it's being pushed out? That will decrease the entropy. You see, anything that will make the system, uh, I mean, you know, will provide the order, will change the entropy. And we are able to calculate all these things, including the dependence of the so-called chi factor. For those of you who are not polymer scientists, the chi factor is a compatibility parameter that tells you how good the polymer is, how thermodynamically good is the polymer with respect to the surrounding uh, fluid. And I will show you just one of the many data. Follow me. This is a chain a tether chain on the surface of what you would call a mucoid heat that is protruding out and it has 40 segments. Do we all understand what 40 segments are? They are 40 repeating units. So it comes out. It is in a system that has a surface coverage of 10%, which means if you think about it, you have a surface and, you know, I don't know, percent, you have a chain here and a chain there, not very close. The chi factor is zero, is zero, it changes. Zero is a rather good compatibility, means compatible. You don't have to worry about it. So we start looking now at the interactions on that surface, and we start looking at it for different conditions. Here's the distance from the surface. Look at this. Here is the chain that is inside, and this is the portion of the chain that is outside. And we see the polymer volume fraction. So we can clearly see under what conditions this chain will contribute to adhesion. And as the scope of the theoretical work it was for us to find the surface covers, the chain length, the interaction parameters. So ladies and gentlemen, obviously I'm very proud of this work and all this work we have done on molecular models. We publish them mostly in chemical physics journals. And we hope that the people in the biomedical field will follow them. I know they're not easy ideas, and sometimes people don't care, but they have helped us come up with new types of systems that are good adhesive systems. One of the things, for example, that came out of this analysis is the strength of the adhesion bond. And we found that it's proportional to the time of contact to the one fourth power and proportional to the molecular weight in the minus one fourth power. These are called scaling laws and they are similar to the laws that somebody like Dejean would have made. Coming back now in the next 20, 25 minutes to the final comments about the application of this of course, we know that in addition to the tethers, functional groups are important. I think Vitali and many others in the audience, I noticed a recent paper just appeared two weeks ago by my very dear friend, Ali Kodem Hasseini. Uh, I forgot to tell you, I don't remember it in the journal, although it's on my desktop. Uh, wonderful paper. Uh, all aspects in the biomedical field of adhesion, bioadhesion. Highly recommend that you find it. Um, so yes, we know that hydroxyl groups or carboxyl groups are very important in those interactions. Also hydrogen forming books, uh, groups. But don't forget in the actual application of the mucoadhesive, now you're going to have other stuff present. For one thing, the protein itself. For another thing, maybe some nutrients maybe some enzymes and so on. So what we do in the laboratory, it appears to be similar to how it will be in the application, but obviously you will have to have cell studies to show it. I want to show you just for a moment this one because it's one of the many, many systems I was going to say. This is the system that was developed by Nagai. You can see his name. Chunei Nagai. Nagai, and actually I took a paper that many of you might be able to read. He's still with us. He's a former president of the Control Relations Society. He is in his middle ages. He's director of the Nagai Foundation now because all the money he got from these products went to that foundation. He doesn't have 
uh, descendants, and it is being used to support people throughout the world who do research. Highly recommend that you approach him if you have some original idea in the pharmaceutical field. So he was the one who took this polyacrylic acids and the carbopoles and created systems by mixing them, especially with HPC. And these were the systems that he used in the very successful AFTAC system. And I'm mentioning that, look at the patents and so on. Of course, it's old, but the thing that I want to say, it's still available. Yeah, you can find it in uh, Japan, in China. I've seen it in Singapore. I've seen it in Indonesia. So the systems are available. They are buccal systems uh, for the delivery of asino. What is that? I don't remember what the drug is, but it is a drug that works very well. And the patients put it about 10, 15 minutes over there. It absorbs water immediately, it becomes adhesive, and then it stays there and it releases. The company that makes them is Teijin, as you can see, major company in Japan. And this is a diagram from the very early days, one of the early pharmaceutical papers in which they saw about the stickiness as a function of the carbopole. And you can see the stickiness becomes higher with the carbopole. I was always then telling Professor Nagai, then say, can you change that and call it adhesion behavior, adhesiveness? And so he says, well, we call it stickiness. And people in Japan understand stickiness better than adhesion, you know. Uh, this is something that I like. I've worked a lot of it is ways by which you can measure the adhesion characteristics. And of course, now if you have tethers, you can incorporate the tethers and you can measure the adhesion. This was something that came out of Ian Kellaway's group. Uh, he was in Cardiff, where, where after that, of course, uh, I mean, they developed really a significant program in that area. And this was something we developed where we had a tensiometric device and we were able to measure the distance and the force. So if you look at it, you look at the force as a function of elongation. At some point, the system comes apart. This is the area under the peak. What is that area? Many of you will rush and say, that's the, the work of adhesion. It's not the work of adhesion. It's the work of fracture. But if adhesion and fracture are um, reversible, then it's equal to adhesion. Well, they're not reversible, but anyhow, many of us, including me, we will take that area under here and call it the work of, of adhesion. And you can see something that you always knew, that as you increase the polyacrylic acid, the carbopole, it becomes a stronger and stronger system. But with MICOS, much later, we did an experiment that was totally different. We took particles and we put them in a special a channel that we did in the laboratory from plexiglass and it was covered on the top and here we would take the mucus of an animal and put it there and you would put one particle or two particles and we had a microscope on top and then we would start passing from the left side fluids air or simply water or guess what water with various nutrients or guess what, eventually we were able to pass a dilute food substrate on top of it. And that way we could measure the change in the distance of that particle from the left to the right. And then that became a very, very important phenomenon. And there are three ways the particle can move. It can move by sliding, it can move by jumping, and it can move by rolling. And each one of these three mechanisms is a different mathematical model. Really fascinating results that help us understand how to come up with new systems. There was another student called Paula Hansen, who was the first one who did an analysis of the diffusion of the system. I have decided not to talk very much about it, especially because I have friends in the field and I have slightly different views than they do, and I have told them. A drug, a therapeutic agent, diffuses through mucus. This is the equation of diffusion. This is the diffusion coefficient. 
as a function of the entropy, the enthalpy, the characteristic length of transport, the temperature. The characteristic length of transport is a function of uh, cross-linking and so on. So for me, mucus is still a deterrent to transport. It may take only 10 minutes to pass through. I agree with you, but it is there. It's another network that slows down the process. And here comes now a major discovery. I used to have a student, I mean, still with us, an uh, Italian student who did her PhD with me, came from Parma, and her name is Alessia De Ascentis, an Italian, of course. And Alessia comes to me one day and said, Nicholas, we can adhere everything you want. How? By putting polyethylene glycol chains in between. How are we going to do that, Alessia? We are going to create a network and swell it and load it with polyethylene glycol and then put it in contact with the mucus. And you know something? The idea, if you think about it, is really based on the original ideas of Dejan and of Matt uh, Turrell and so on. And indeed, that's what we did. And we created structures that could last for two, three, four, five, six hours. And then, of course, eventually came the day where we decided to react, not simply leave the peg in there, but react the peg in the system. I'm giving you some of the papers. They have a little bit of history, some of the early data, but now we know the systems work well. So let me come then to this diagram, which hopefully will summarize quite a few things and you'll see, we'll show you some of the people that work with me right now. I have a three-dimensional network. It, it is the red thing that you see over here. In my case, polymethacrylic acid, but it could be something else. But I want it to be hydrophilic. And I have these tethers. And these are polyethylene glycols. It's different molecular weights. I'm bringing it in contact with the mucosa and the tethers start penetrating and go across the mucosa. So suddenly I have a bond that stays there for a period of time. It's not a covalent bond. It's not even an ionic bond, but it is a bond that stays. And obviously the longer the peg chains, the higher the possibility for that to interact. So this is a wonderful way I can have particles passing on top of the mucosa and being grabbed and staying there. You see why I wanted to talk to you today? Because I wanted to show really that there is so much more we can do on bioadhesion and mucoadhesion and cell adhesion. And that's simply saying that, uh, simply saying that while well, we have a new system that is adhesive is not enough if you don't understand the mechanism. Uh, also, the nice thing about some of these systems is that different pHs, they extend the tethers, at other pHs they don't. So look at this, this is a system that extends its tethers at 7.4, not at 3.2, which means now you can take a system orally and it will extend its tethers only at 7.4. 7.4 is under the pylorus in the upper small intestine. Perfect. That's where I want it to work. So suddenly the particles, when they pass through the stomach, they don't stick. They arrive into the upper small intestine and they stick. And it's a wonderful idea. And then you say, what will happen to the particles after that? They will pass in a feces. I'm not talking about biodegradable particles. Unless we are working for the delivery of an SIRNA for the treatment of Crohn's disease or IBD or something like that then of course the particle itself will get into the cells and we have it to be biodegradable. But in all other cases, it doesn't. So again, once more, you remember, this is one of the many papers we wrote with Eagle Slifert. All these papers, suddenly they tell us how to design the tethers. And there are more and more papers you see in Langmuir. I don't know if some of you can recognize here Debbie Leckman. Debbie Leckman was a PhD or a postdoc of Bob Langer, who became an independent professor at the University of Illinois. And we worked together, we published in Langmuir, 
how the two surfaces come together. And there are ways to do that. There is a machine, machine, <laughs> an equipment that was developed by Professor Israel Asvili in Canberra, in Australia. Israel Asvili came to the United States. He was at Santa Barbara and he passed away a few years ago. But this equipment, we use that and another equipment which exists at Paris Sud in Paris in order for us to come up with a direct measurement of the interactions of those tether chains with an absorbed music. Finally, these are some of the papers and applications. And finally, you can see Laura Serra, one of the best students I ever had. I met her in Barcelona when I was giving a seminar in 2001. Within one semester, she decided to come with me, to work with me to do her PhD. And she finished and then she would go back. Well, guess what? <laughs> 20 years later, <laughs> she's in the United States and she's director of ABV right now. Now, something that you need to know, because I'm turning back to the bio applications, is that all these things I told you, other people were looking at them a little bit. One of those others was Klaus Michael Lea of the University of Saarbrücken. Now, I don't remember if he was already, I think he was already in Saarbrücken at that time, but you know, he was looking at Carbopol 934. So you can say not exactly the same work as ours, but he was trying to use it as a medium to, uh, to, to, to deliver peptides and, and to deliver some of the compounds. And he discovered that carbopal 934 does not inhibit, inhibits, not does not inhibit, inhibits the degradation of peptides. So there is always a serendipity in what you do. Uh, we know now why the carboxyl groups do that, but suddenly all these systems, all these carriers, they are adhesive, they are well controlled, they have a polyethylene glycol, and at the same time, they have this ability to prevent uh, prevent uh, degradation because of, uh, of enzymes. So this is how some of these systems work and perhaps some of you are familiar with it. It's a capsule. The capsule contains the nanoparticles. The nanoparticles in them contain the tethers, everything that I told you, certain size, certain characteristics. Of course, the system is purified and clean. No, I don't make kilos like Anna does. I am fascinated to see what Anna does, magnificent work. We do small particles, we pass them to the company and then the company develop them. And so it comes the stomach and guess what? In the stomach pH two, nothing happens. The system is collapsed. And then they go in the upper small intestine and then in upper small intestine, the particles open up, here's the tethers. The tethers go next to the tissue, the epithelial cells, and you start having this interaction, this adhesive interaction. And now, of course, as your previous speaker said, there will be the question of passage, whether they pass paracellularly or transcellularly. Please look at the literature we have done and that don't have time today to give you all these slides. I was thinking last night of adding some slides on endocytosis, but there's no time. Yes, you can have saccharin molecules that can pass a protein to the other side by endocytosis, by vesicular transport. But here I show you the first application, which really shows you how eventually you can have the release of the therapeutic agent. This is for the case of calcitonin for the treatment of postmenopausal women. So there are some challenges. One is the degradation by the proteolytic enzymes. I think we have solved that. The other one is the adsorption, the penetration, the adsorption, the bioadhesion is unfortunately very often affected by the food. Ladies and gentlemen, it goes without saying if you want systems like this to be used in humans, and we do, you're not going to ask the human not to eat for eight hours. You have no product. So these systems are given with food, which means that by the time they are in the upper small intestine, they compete with the chyme, C-H-Y-M-E, the chyme, 
the, the uh, digested product of the food that is viscoelastic and it's next to the, to the particles. I'm not going to say anything more except to say we have made them intelligible, trying to avoid, intelligent, trying to avoid uh, some of this adhesion by food. Uh, this is another story that we don't have time to discuss today. This is how they work. And I have a few more slides that I don't have time to show you, but this is very, very important. It shows you that the actual dynamic response of these nanoparticles, the small time they are in the upper small intestine, actually I have it at a pH 5.5, in the upper small intestine is even faster, and is one minute and 40 seconds. So you're going to say, what kind of a drug delivery system is this? It's a drug delivery system that prevents the therapeutic agent, recognizes when it's time to open up the tethers, creates the bioadhesion, starts releasing the insulin, this particular case calcitonin, and eventually goes out and leaves in the feces. As far as I'm concerned, that's a very intelligent system. And there are, I cannot go into all the details, but there is a very well-known company that is progressing with this system. Very, very briefly, and all of you know it, there are all kinds of cell studies that you can do in the laboratory to see really how the transport happens. We, like Per Arthurson, like Ken Otis and others, Per Arthurson is in Uppsala, we have developed uh, knowledge based on KCO2 cells. The only problem with KCO2 cells is they don't have mucus. Uh, we create a very nice layer, one layer with good confluency. And then we do cell studies, what we call the trans epithelial resistance, trying to see really if something happens to the gel and if it penetrates through. Uh, these are some of our latest studies. I highly recommend you go to the International Gel Pharmaceutics to see Bill Lichtis and uh, and uh, Rebecca Cyril's work, uh, all of them, he is now with Dow, there is a biological division, she is with Smithkline, Smith -Klein, and she is with, uh, uh, with Merck. So, you know, our students really do well. And of course, all of you are familiar with the trans well cells, you put the polycarbonate membrane, you put the particles on top of it and you measure the possible transport. The way you do the transport is by measuring the trans electronic, the, the, the trans epithelial electrical resistance. If you have resistance, there is no transport. If you want, if you don't have resistance, there is transport. And this is the typical result that shows you here it is. This is a series of particles containing this particular material with the tethers, with the adhesion that comes in contact with the KCO2 cells and suddenly the resistance goes down. But if it went down and never went up, that's not a good system. Eventually it goes up and you recreate the epithelial cells. So with all these things, I will stop and say first how delighted I am to spend some time with you, especially with the students and the former students from Reading. I think very highly of Vitali and really what he has done in the field. And he has always been a very, very careful scientist. I continue working, you can see my group these are pictures actually post-COVID, <laughs> but we still wear masks and so on. This is a group that is working on the application of this thing now for siRNA. Uh, and you can see, and if you look at it carefully, it is a group that covers all areas and all nationalities. There are students there from Nigeria, from Bangladesh, from India, from Indonesia, from many from South America and Central America. And you can see NIH and NSF supports as well. So I want to thank you. I apologize that I am a few minutes late, but I'm the last speaker. So, so probably that's now you can go in for a nice tea at four o'clock 
and I can go have a talk in about half an hour, 11 o'clock. But I don't mind that. It has been a pleasure. Thank you, Vitali. Thank you, everybody. I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for this absolutely fantastic lecture.